A couple of things are worth noting about all these trends. First, almost all of these issues are likely to be felt especially acutely by Illinois residents of color. For instance, we know that Illinois Black and Latinx residents were likely to start 2020 with less housing stability than white Illinois. This means Black and Latinx residents are also more likely to face eviction or foreclosure as the COVID-19 crisis set in. Second, and this follows from the first point, all of these issues are in some ways manifestations of much deeper problems that we've known about for a long time. For example, state and federal support for essential infrastructure like transit agencies and water utilities has been on a long downward trend. COVID-19 simply puts a punctuation mark on that long drawn out trend. Next slide, please. Thankfully, we started the year with both a lame duck session and change in leadership at the state level that demonstrated General Assembly increasingly open to racial equity reforms in state politics and an appetite to address those problems. Notably, the Legislative Black Caucus advanced some major economic, criminal justice, and education reforms uh, to address some of the sy systemic problems that we talked about in the last slide. They did that during the lame duck session in early January. Likewise, State Representative Chris Welch was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives, ending the U.S.'s longest and arguably most storied State House leadership run and installing the state's first Black Speaker. This change in leadership will no doubt have a big effect on how House business in, is conducted in ways that we can't even really fully anticipate yet. Meanwhile, there are some ongoing challenges to just running the legislature's business in the context of COVID-19. The House just in the past month passed rules allowing virtual committee hearings and the Senate has been running them since August of 2020. Uh, this is to the celebration of some and the chagrin of others, uh, but it hopefully at least we'll get some more cat video mishaps out of it, like the one that appeared in West Texas uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, let's not forget that in, the, in all the other news in 2020, it was also a census year which means that there are legislative district maps to be drawn at both the federal and state level. Getting maps drawn will certainly be a big priority for the General Assembly this year. Next slide, please. So in the context of all of this, MPC is advocating for policies that both alleviate some of the major crises we're facing and addressing the systemic roots of these problems. At the state level, we support transportation policies that enhance investment in the forms of transportation that Illinois' Black and Latinx residents rely on, like transit, walking, and biking. For water infrastructure, we advocate for policies that ensure everyone has access to safe and affordable drinking water, and that every community has the resources they need to invest in their drinking and stormwater infrastructure. Next slide, please. In the realm of housing, we advocate for creating new affordable housing and ensuring that the state's most housing insecure can get access to stable places to live. And then finally, we won't be talking about these today, but we also advocate for policies that build wealth in Black and Latinx communities and that create more effective and transparent government systems. So with all that, uh, I want to now turn it over to MPC's Manager of Housing and Community Development, Amadou Jume, who's going to talk about some of the work we're doing to secure housing for Illinois residents. Thank you, Justin, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amadou Jume. I'm the Housing and Community Development Policy Manager at MPC. Uh, I want to, before I get started, provide a brief disclaimer and a, also a brief overview of how things will run, at least in this section. We are uh, have a lot of information that we want to convey to you uh, in a limited amount of time. And for that reason, I'll move rather expeditiously through these slides. We will, as Justin mentioned earlier, have an opportunity to field some questions. Um, and I'll, after my time has passed, I'm happy to field some questions through the Q&A feature. Um, with respect to this presentation, I'm going to share the policy agenda with you verbally in a moment, and then I'll share some information that explains um, the nature of the problems that we are attempting to address through our housing uh, policy agenda um, as well. Uh, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Our housing policy agenda focuses on three specific areas. Um, first, preserving existing affordable housing and incentivizing the development and hopefully subsequent preservation of new affordable housing through targeted property tax incentives. Uh, secondly, we wanna make housing accessible for people with arresting conviction records. And third, we wanna provide relief to renters, housing providers and homeowners who've been impacted by COVID-19. Um, this slide that you now see um, 
essentially lays bare the nature of our state's affordable housing crisis, as well as our cities prior to the pandemic. I suspect that once all tallied up, things will look a bit different. Um, but right now there are only 36 affordable units um, and or affordable homes for every 100 extremely low uh, renter households in Illinois. Um, and 71% of the poorest renter households in Illinois spend more than half their income on housing, uh, which leaves them with not much left over for other expenses. Ideally, uh, folks would be spending 30% or less um, on housing expenses. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, as a state, we're short 290 almost affordable homes uh, for the same population. And the city of Chicago is short 120,000 uh, affordable homes for this population. So this, um, just for context, is just part of our thinking and deciding why we want to produce and uh, preserve uh, affordable housing. Um, the next slide um, is really about reentry housing and uh, explaining, um, or you know, makes the case at least I think for us spending a significant amount of our policy agenda in the, in the housing context, um, focusing on helping people with arrest and conviction records. Uh, most people would be, would be surprised to know that 42% of working age Illinoisans have an arrest or conviction record. To be clear, that amounts to about 4.2 million people in our state. And given how just about half of the people who entered the Illinois Department of Corrections come from Cook County, um, this is obviously an issue that's very important to our region. Um, when I see this slide, I see that um, you know folks who are disproportionately impacted by homelessness, especially amongst those who uh, are formerly incarcerated, um, we see that this disproportionately impacts women, uh, certainly impacts black and brown people uh, living in our region, um, as well as individuals who've been incarcerated more uh, than one time. Uh, the next slide, in my view, really speaks to the need for us to develop a better continuum, a better housing continuum for people who've been released from incarceration. Um, as you can see uh, in the dead center that um, compared to the general public or people who've only been incarcerated once, folks who've been incarcerated more than once um, tend to uh, experience homelessness at higher rates, um, disproportionately higher rates. And this just kind of creates a never ending cycle. Once you've been incarcerated, you struggle with housing, become homeless. You know, sometimes that's grounds for a technical violation and it leads to further incarceration, further homelessness, and people get trapped in this cycle. Um, and so we need to develop a better continuum. Uh, one of the things that you know, I'd also share is that relative to other states, Illinois does not invest, and specifically our state government does not invest um, nearly as much as other states with lower recidivism rates in transitional housing um, and supportive housing specifically for this population. Um, and as you can see by the two data points on the side, um, this is, you know, just gives a snapshot into what uh, is happening in the city of Chicago and, and how um, severe uh, this issue is uh, for folks. Um, this next slide transitions into some of the rationale behind our pandemic ideas. Um, as, as you can see, renters and homeowners have lost income and have fallen behind on housing payments. Um, and obviously that arrearage in, in payments also means that housing providers and mortgage providers uh, are behind on expected income as well. Um, and so it's important that in our solutions that we think about this holistically and not only address the needs of renters and homeowners, uh, but recognize that when we um, provide relief for renters and homeowners that we're really trying to make sure that the economy is still going and that those who were, who were expecting those payments uh, still receive them. Um, and the final slide really just, uh, or not the final slide, an almost final slide, um, demonstrates the pandemic's uh, disproportionate impact on non-white families uh, throughout the country, but certainly um, this is what's happening as well uh, within the state of Illinois. Um, and finally, uh, the policy agenda. Again, I shared these slides earlier, um, or these 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 points earlier, uh, but here they are. And uh, J Justin, perhaps this is an opportunity for us to pause and 
do a little Q&A if that's okay. Sure thing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box yet. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and we'll, or sorry, in the Q&A function and we will get to those when they come up. Um, but if there are no quick clarifying questions, maybe we'll get back to, the, to, to Audrey and then we can come back at the, at the end. Ellen, I will put your question in the question box and we can get to that at the end. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Audrey Wenick, our Director of Transportation, and she's gonna talk about some of our transportation priorities. Hi, um, I'm glad to be here today to talk about uh, three policies that we're working on advancing. Um, the first is uh, performance-based planning. If we can uh, advance the slide, we can talk about um, how in 2019, um, you may be aware that there was a, a very large capital bill called Rebuild Illinois, which uh, gave us a lot more resources for infrastructure and a, a large proportion of that is for transportation. But what it did not do was establish any parameters for how that increased funding gets used. And at MPC, we, we tend to say that revenue and revenue should revenue and reform should come together. Um, just increasing funding without a clear process for how that money gets spent may mean that it's not getting spent in the optimum way. And the world of transportation is changing dramatically daily. We need to be flexible, we need to be innovative in how we solve our problems. And we also need to take a human-centered approach. What do people really want in terms of having safe and livable communities where they can access what they need. Transportation is a means to an end, not an end in of itself. Can move to the next slide? Yes, and, and so really a key precept of performance-based planning is focusing on the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. The Federal Highway Administration has been promoting this methodology for about the past decade or more and is institutionalizing this at the federal level. And this is about thinking about the results we want to get. It's, it's not about the projects that engineers know how to build, that, that we want to build. We don't start with the projects. We have to think about what results we want. And uh, that will give us the livability and access outcomes that we want from our transportation. And on the next slide, I'll show you uh, how IDOT, Illinois DOT, did dip its toe into this in 2017. You can see on this slide uh, a number of criteria that were used and, and can be used again for prioritizing uh, transportation investments. We really need to look at our transportation holistically. Transportation has a huge impact on communities and uh, it's a lot more than just thinking about congestion. Uh, we need to think about uh, safety and economic development and livability and multimodal access and the environment. Uh, and so a, a value-driven tool which focuses on outcomes would help us prioritize our investments more effectively. And we really feel that the residents of Illinois deserve to know how a project is ranking and why projects get funded. And this um, methodology will help us do that and increase transparency. We also feel, so you'll, you'll notice that this slide does not have equity on it. So if we move to the next slide, you can see um, the importance of adding equity to this approach. Um, we've done a, a number of uh, research efforts recently on transportation equity. Um, you can see in the map to the right, uh, for example, of the 100 census tracts in the Chicago region with the longest commutes, 95 are majority Black or Latinx, and they have uh, lower incomes than the median. We need to be really focusing on providing benefits uh, and reducing burdens to these populations um, and allocating resources based on communities' needs. So we would advocate that a performance-based planning mechanism in Illinois should absolutely include equity. I also want to emphasize that this type of approach has been used in a number of other states. Um, Virginia is perhaps the best known model. They uh, 
use a tool called Smart Scale, and this slide shows an example of how they score projects. This is an individual project. You can see uh, how much it costs. You can see what score it got. You can see where it is. Um, and we would like to see this type of transparency in the state of Illinois. It doesn't mean that things are always perfect, but it means we know how decisions are made and we can continue to refine the processes as we move forward. These benefits uh, shown on this slide have been realized by other states. And I also want to highlight a brand new report that just came out this week by the Illinois Economic Policy Institute that explains in a great more detail how other states have done this, uh, what the benefits could be for our state, and uh, it's, it's available online. So, so take a look. Now I'd like to, um, I'm gonna, before I move into uh, a couple other bills, I want to just uh, note that this is all actually uh, becoming very real. There is a bill, uh, a live bill, that was introduced by Representative Cam Buckner uh, recently, and a companion bill will be introduced by Senator Ram Bilvalam very shortly. Um, there was a press conference on um, these bill this bill uh, just this week, and um, there's some, some traction moving forward. Um, there's also going to be a committee hearing uh, just on Monday uh, where this is going to, this bill in particular is going to go through through committee. Um, so we'll, we'll give you a little more detail about that in a minute. So the next, I'll go more quickly through two other uh, efforts that we're uh, advocating. There is another bill, um, HB 270, which is also a live bill, uh, which would support a change in how IDOT spends its resources uh, on sidewalks. Currently, uh, IDOT requires that an investment in a sidewalk uh, come along with a 20% match from a local jurisdiction. Um, meanwhile, they spend 100%, uh, they cover 100% of the costs for roads. Uh, and we know that state roads are often major streets that provide access to retail service industry jobs. There are many people who don't drive, children, older people, people with dis disabilities, and sidewalks are really, really critical. Um, so what we would advocate for is that IDOT pay 100% of transportation, uh, of pedestrian uh, expenses for uh, sidewalks and side paths. And I'll just note one statistic um, that only 32% of state-owned roads have a sidewalk on both sides. So this just goes to show that there's a real need for increased investment. And then the last um, item I'll talk about is uh, about efforts to reduce travel speeds. And this is very much related to traffic safety. As you can see um, from this graphic, the difference of 10 miles an hour can mean the difference of life or death. Uh, and 20 miles per hour, it goes from nine out of people, nine out of 10 pedestrians surviving to nine out of 10 pedestrians dying. Uh, speed is really, really important. And uh, in Chicago, Black Chicagoans are more than twice as likely to be killed in a traffic crash than white Chicagoans. Uh, and pedestrians and bicyclists are much more likely to be seriously injured in a collision. And what is also important to know is that speed is occurring not only on highways, it's largely these crashes are happening on local streets only a small percentage of incidents happen on highways. So this is something that's happening in our neighborhoods. It's happening in our downtowns. And um, if we look at the next slide, the idea here is to pass enabling legislation so that the city of Chicago and perhaps other municipalities around the state would have the ability to reduce their speed limits. Right now, the state requires that if you do make a change, then you have to put up a sign on every street, which is not practical and is preventing these types of changes. So um, we would advocate that uh, if this were allowed um, at the state level, then municipalities could then move forward and change speed limits uh, as appropriate to increase the safety of, of their communities. And many other cities have done this, Boston, Seattle, Philadelphia, Portland, Portland all recently reduced speed limits. And, and so this, this seems like a very reasonable and effective uh, approach to increasing traffic safety. Um, and this, um, there is no uh, live bill for this 
yet, but as I mentioned, the other two uh, pieces of legislation do exist and there's a hearing on Monday. And um, we're gonna drop into the chat some information about if you would like to express support for either of those previous two bills. There's a mechanism called um, slipping in support. So basically just filling in a form um, where you would say, uh, I support this bill, um, either on behalf of your organization or as an individual. Um, if you would like additional information, you're, we at MPC would be more than happy to, to talk with you more about that. Uh, so I will uh, finish there. Thanks, Audrey. Um, there are just a couple clarifying questions that I wanted to ask. So one on the 2017 uh, IDOT value-driven model, was that actually ever implemented or what's the status of that now? It was, it, it was tested in a limited way by IDOT once. Um, so the, uh, the slide that um, was shown with the matrix was from the multi-year plan uh, in 2018 to 20, you can see it's 2018 to 2023 multi-year plan. It was used, so it's referenced there. That's the only public reference um, about it. Um, and so I think that's, I, I, the question really uh, allows me to, to note that um, IDOT would not be starting from scratch at all. Um, they have done a lot of this work. What our objective is here is to institutionalize this process and make sure that it gets, the, the foundation that's already been set gets used, uh, that we make a few tweaks, and that we uh, set in motion a process by which we're doing this every year to inform the multi-year plan. Great, thanks Audrey. Um, so with that, I'm going to now turn to Josh Ellis, Vice President at MTC, who's going to talk about water infrastructure policy in Illinois. Uh, and I just want to signal, I do see that there are some questions coming in the Q&A and we'll get to those uh, more towards the end of the session here. Thanks Justin, uh, and thanks everyone for spending this hour. It used to be the lunch hour. I don't know if it's the lunch hour uh, in COVID times, but appreciate everyone being here. And Alan Mellis, I want you to know I miss you, man. Someday we'll do this in person again. Next slide. Let's talk about some water resources issues. The big one that we are working on, as well as many partners, many of whom are on the call today, uh, are lead pipes. Uh, I, I hope I don't need to go into a lot of detail. Lead is, lead is bad. There's no safe amount of lead uh, and lead exposure at a young age can cause serious health effects uh, in children uh, that last into adulthood. And I want to be very clear, we are all currently paying for the costs of lead in increased health costs, increased education costs, increased criminal justice costs. Uh, we are currently paying for the problem. The bill that I'm going to talk about is about paying for the solution. And as a taxpayer, uh, that's where I would prefer my money to be going. Lead, a problem, we need to get rid of it. Lead is clearly present in paint. Uh, lead is also present in soil. Uh, all that lead, uh, leaded gasoline we used to use, that lead trickled down and deposited in soil. Uh, but we also have lead in pipes. And the cumulative exposure to lead uh, that leaches out of pipes or solder or lead from paint or lead from soil, that cumulative exposure is a problem and we need solutions uh, for all three of those exposure types. Most of the lead that we're talking about is in the service line. It's that small, narrow line connecting from the water main under the street into a property, mostly uh, single family homes or, or two flat homes. And that line in most places is partially owned by your utility. And in Illinois, most utilities are uh, the same as the unit of government, the municipality. Um, but there are some private utilities. There are some consolidated regional utilities. Uh, and then the customer, Whoever owns the property owns a portion of the line, and there can be lead in both uh, both parts. Um, one of the challenges I, I will say in removing lead is removing both parts of that pipe: utility-owned side uh, and the customer-owned side. Uh, we have uh, we have more lead pipes in Illinois than anywhere else in the country. Uh, roughly one out of eight of every lead pipes in the state is here uh, in the country is here. Uh, we know that we have over 686,000. Uh, we suspect we may have as many as a, a, as a million. Uh, and you can see the map there on the right. We have lead pipes in pretty much every county of Illinois. Uh, certainly Chicago, uh, the city of Chicago, which has approximately 380,000 lead pipes, has a lot of them. Um, but once we fully tally lead pipes throughout the state, it may well be that 
uh, the majority of lead pipes are outside of Chicago uh, rather than inside Chicago. This is a distributed problem, requires a distributed solution. Next slide. Um, consistent with some of Justin's opening uh, comments about who is harmed by some of these issues, uh, we did some research recently, uh, and I'm not sure this is surprising, uh, it perhaps is sobering, uh, just to just to really nail down on the, the data available, uh, that 65% of the state's Black and Latinx population live in the municipalities of Illinois that have 95% of the lead lines. Uh, I'll just say that again, 65% of the Black and Latinx population of the state live in communities that have 95% of the lead lines. You may very well say, well, but 380,000 of those are in Chicago. True. If you take Chicago and its population and its lead lines out, that ratio still holds. Okay. So in the rest of Illinois, uh, lead pipes are disproportionate, disproportionately uh, exposed, uh, exposing Black and Latinx families and kids. Next slide. So, uh, we and many partners have been working on legislation uh, for years, and, and a, uh, an initial bill has been reintroduced this year. It's Senate Bill 556. That's Senator Melinda Bush. The version in the House is House Bill 3739. That's Representative Lamont Robinson. He's my representative, uh, so thank you, Representative Robinson. Um, we need a statewide plan. Uh, we need dedicated funding to replace these lead service lines. Uh, replacing lead lines is on top of other water management issues uh, like treatment or fixing old leaky pipes. Uh, but we need funding specifically to do this. There are a variety of ways to do that, uh, to, to collect that funding, um, but we need one that is distributed across the state. We are currently all paying for the problem. We need to all pay for the solution. There need to be protections for low income uh, individuals uh, who are disproportionately affected by all this. Uh, and we believe the bill does that. Um, we need to focus on uh, prioritization of vulnerable populations, whether that's uh, kids or uh, communities, uh, Black and Lex communities with uh, disproportionate amounts of these pipes. Uh, and we need to make sure that the jobs that are created here are experienced in the communities uh, that are suffering from lead exposure. Uh, and just to be clear, we're talking about decades and decades of replacing these pipes. Uh, what is a, uh, a job today digging a trench uh, to replace a pipe could 30 years from now uh, be a career and a family-owned business uh, focusing on lead pipe replacement. We need timelines, we need technical support uh, for staffing at the state, technical assistance to communities who might struggle to develop their plans. We want to set communities up for success. We don't want to set anyone up for failure. That means funding, that means support, and that means realistic timelines. Next. Uh, beyond lead service line replacement, which is already big, uh, there's a bunch of other things uh, that are in front of the legislature uh, right now. Uh, water shutoffs uh, during the pandemic. People are at home. Kids are at home. We need water. Uh, and we're seeing more and more stories about utilities uh, resuming water shutoffs. We feel that water shutoffs, just like uh, evictions, should be fully on hold until this pandemic is behind us. So there's a bill uh, from Illinois Environmental Council that's been introduced uh, to halt shutoffs uh, for the time being. Uh, a couple of years ago, we passed a bill to study why water rates are going up in different ways in different places. Uh, that was never funded. Uh, $318,000 a year for two years to really get a handle on all of the drivers for escalating water rates uh, and what could be done about it. Uh, and then uh, outside the context of legislation, uh, Illinois EPA and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources have processes going on either with uh, loan programs that they run or the state water plan uh, that we see and many of our partners see as opportunities uh, to inform with both uh, sustainability driven uh, policies, but also those uh, that account for racial and economic justice and reparation for past harm uh, and lead pipes fall squarely in that category. Happy to answer any questions. Happy to be part of the discussion. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Josh. Uh, one clarifying question. Are there, so are there temporary filters or devices that people can put on their faucets at home to filter out lead in the interim while the state solution is being worked on? Y yes, uh, although very few of those filters remove all the lead. I mean, the most important thing you can do uh, whether you're in Chicago or the suburbs is determine whether you have a lead pipe. 
if your home in Chicago is a single or two family home, two flat home, and it was built before 1986, unless you know that the lead pipe has been replaced, it probably has a lead pipe. If you're in a bigger multifamily building, it probably doesn't. But getting it tested, uh, determining whether you have a lead pipe and then testing your water is the first thing to do. Um, I will remind everyone that bottled water is less regulated than tap water uh, in terms of its quality. Uh, and so get a filter, test your water before you resort to bottled water, which is also a thousand times as expensive per ounce and creates a lot of waste. Thank you, Josh. Um, so uh, at this point, I want to turn back to the group as a whole. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I'll take facilitators prerogative and I will uh, ask that question to the panel. Um, so I, I guess I just want to ask, you know, what do you guys think is the biggest challenge to advancing your policy agenda in 2021 for your different program areas? And on a more hopeful note, what are some of the biggest opportunities that you're seeing in 2021? Well, I'm unmuted, so I'll go first. Uh, I'll say for the lead pipe replacement bill, let's be clear, replacing somewhere between 600,000 and a million lead pipes uh, will not be inexpensive. Again, we'd be paying for the solution instead of the problem. And that price tag could be in the billions over, over decades. Um, that's gonna be a hard pill for some folks to, to swallow. Uh, so really focusing on the benefits of it uh, in terms of re removing that harm uh, from, from our water uh, and job creation is a big part of it. Um, the other reality is that typically in Illinois, our water bills only pay for our own water utility. In order to really have a statewide solution, we're going to need to generate revenue that can be distributed throughout the state. Now, that's what taxes are. Uh, that happens with tolls. It happens with a variety of other forms of payments that we make uh, to government, but typically not with water rates in Illinois. So the, the, the notion of having some sort of fee associated with rates or something like that will just be new and different in this state. And I think we'll need to get over that hurdle too. So there are some challenges, uh, but I hope folks can see that the cost of inaction is continued harm and the cost of the solution is worth paying. Um, in, the, in the context of housing, um, as it relates to your, your question, Justin, I think the, the fundamental issue that still exists is that wages over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years have remained effectively flat when adjusted for inflation, but housing expenses continue to rise and increase. Um, and the amount of subsidy, the amount of incentives that we, uh, that government in particular puts towards housing just hasn't increased in parity with the cost of, um, of, of, of housing uh, as, as it exists today. And so uh, many of the solutions, even the one that we're working on, will help encourage and help foster a better culture and a, and a better situation where housing is more affordable in the relative sense. But in order to change things radically, we have to fundamentally change the, the compensation levels that people have, the amount of income they're bringing in. Um, and we have to figure out how we close the divide between people's incomes and the cost of housing. I mean, that's, that's, that's essentially the ball game. Um, and so in some ways we're somewhat limited in our state situation within the state with state solutions in terms of what we can do and how far we can go. Doesn't mean that we don't play a role and that the legislation uh, that we're working on, uh, HB, I think 805 or 850, forgive me if I misquote, 805, right, Justin? Um, it doesn't mean that it's not gonna be effective, doesn't mean that it's not gonna help, but it's just one strategy. Uh, and we need our federal partners, local governments as well um, to pitch in and, and help close the gap. And then we also have to be serious about um, you know, addressing people's incomes. I think one positive um, out of all of this is that um, the General Assembly and the change of the guard that you referenced earlier certainly is open to these ideas. Um, in addition to there being leadership changes uh, with um, our, our new speaker of the house, uh, the committee chairs have also changed as well. And many of these people have track records of supporting many of the policy agenda items that we've shared today. 
Yeah, and I, I would I'll reinforce uh, what Amadou just said uh, from from the transportation standpoint. Um, there's some great new leadership. Um, Senator uh, Villa Vlam is chair of the Senate Transportation Committee and is really championing this uh, performance based planning legislation. Uh, these legisla legislators uh, really get it. They get equity and they are uh, really uh, understanding how to uh, explain the benefits of this type of legislation. Uh, we, we think that this is a really, you know, it, there's a lot of opportunity this year more than there has been in the past in terms of the uh, ability to get this moving forward. There are a lot of stakeholders that are on, uh, on board. Um, there are many diverse transportation stakeholders around the state uh, and many, many important ones are on board with this. And um, I think the other opportunity is for, uh, for us to do something that increases transparency. I mean, I think we all need that in, in Illinois uh, and we all want that and taxpayers need that. And we should be concerned um, if we're not getting transparency of how billions of dollars are being spent. And, and so um, there's just, I think, a lot of momentum to do things like this. And that's, this is what we should be doing in other, uh, we've seen that it's successful in other states and the federal government supports it. So um, this is a, a, a great opportunity to actually institutionalize it. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, clearly plenty of both challenges and opportunities for advancing this agenda in 2021. Um, I, I now want to start working through some of the questions that folks in our audience have asked, um, and I, I'll start with one to Amadou. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the landscape of proposals for transitional housing uh, at the state level? What does that look like, and where are those? Where are there any best practices Illinois could follow? Thank you, um, th and thank you for that question. I, I saw it in the chat, and I, I certainly want to speak to it. Um, I think it's important to note, uh, to just ground, uh, provide a little background. Uh, when we're talking about people who've been um, arrested and, and incarcerated, we're talking about individuals who, at least upon release, have effectively no income. And so there was a slide that I shared as one of the first ones. They are, they are in that very low income category. These are people who, in housing speak, would be under uh, at or below 30% of the area median income in just about any uh, area in this country uh, upon release from incarceration, and they have effectively no incomes. Why is that important? Um, as we think about the continuum, we have to think about transitional housing, but then we have to think about what people are transitioning to. And we have to, we have to make sure that our housing interventions align with the needs of people where they're at. So if people are at, at very low income, we have to provide housing solutions that meet them where they're at. Uh, that is not necessarily workforce housing. That looks more like a subsidy. Um, it, it looks more like people being, um, having access to uh, either public housing or housing that comes with a, a voucher or some subsidy attached to it that's fairly significant. And although, you know, you know we've been hit, uh, over recent decades, probably the last 40, 50 years, by mass incarceration and public attitudes that have been fairly hostile to the idea of people with records having access to, you know, public dollars that subsidize their housing, uh, people pay for it either way. You know, you're going to pay for it one way or another. You, you'll either pay $151,000 every time somebody recidivates and goes back into incarceration per individual, uh, or you can subsidize housing. You know, it's kind of your choice is a, is, a, is a policy mechanism, if you will. Um, and so when I look at the landscape, I think it's, it's also important to be mindful of those things. Uh, states like Ohio, uh, where uh, our, direct, our current director in Illinois uh, for the Department of Corrections, uh, Rob Jeffries, comes from, uh, they invest far more dollars in transitional housing uh, relative to uh, the state of Illinois. And their recidivism rate, at least at one point in time, was about half. Uh, the rate of, of Illinois as well. And so we should look to states that have not only invested those dollars in, in, in higher, uh, at higher levels, but also who have done an effective job of bringing services that are of high quality into environments where people are um, being housed in transitional housing. Thanks, Amadou. And I, 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 that touches on another question that I think is maybe relevant for Josh. Um, and that's a, a question here in the chat box, which is asking for some more information about the costs of lead service line replacement. 
uh, as opposed to the costs we're already paying? Like, how does that stack up? What's the what's the cost benefit analysis here? Yeah, so the cost of the actual replacement is a a good question. A little bit of a unicorn of an answer. Uh, we have heard that communities in Illinois are replacing lead lines, including the privately owned customer side, for four thousand dollars per pipe, and we've heard. $28,000 per pipe, and we've heard multiple numbers in between. What's unclear is whether or not that $4,000 number is uh, because they've achieved economies of scale, they're doing it in conjunction with a main replacement, a variety of other things, and, and whether that $28,000 is just, you know, if we were to walk out in the street today, dig up the, dig up the sidewalk and replace the pipe. So our premise in moving toward a statewide requirement, timelines, guidance from the state on, on lead service line replacement plans is that we will start to share more ideas between uh, communities on how to get to that lower end number, which will of course make the whole thing more affordable uh, and faster to do. Uh, we believe that uh, based on our research that some of the costs of the problem uh, include uh, increased cardiovascular health related costs uh, of, you know, $25,000 or so uh, a person or, or, or higher. Uh, and so again, we think in time over these next few decades of replacement, uh, and then the next few decades of kids who grow up without lead exposure, uh, that we will bring healthcare costs down, hopefully education costs, because uh, there are attention deficit issues that come with lead and a variety of other things. It will take a while to recoup the costs of this through the benefits because we need generations of kids to not be exposed to lead for the first time in a while, um, but we believe it's worth it. Uh, one for Audrey. Um, can you talk a little bit about the implications of performance-based planning on uh, what projects get funded in Illinois? And specifically, is this ultimately going to funnel dollars into Northeast Illinois and harm downstate communities? Yeah, this is this methodology is intended to be able to be customized by different areas of the state. And so while you might have a set, one set of performance measures, um, they can be weighted very differently throughout the state. So that's, that's the beauty of this methodology. So for example, if you're in, uh, if you're looking in at projects in district one, which is uh, IDOT's district that covers Chicago, uh, you might, uh, focus on congestion more than you would downstate, maybe downstate you're looking more at access uh, to ports or um, freight uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture based freight, uh, and you might weight that higher. So this can be very much tailored to the different needs of different areas of the state. Um, another one for Amadou. Um, how do housing providers, uh, how can housing providers continue to provide stable housing when there is an eviction on moratoria, on, on uh, sorry, when there's an, a moratoria yeah. on evictions yeah. at the state right now? How, how is that going to be possible for housing providers? I mean, it's going to be a, a challenge, right? That's the, that's, that's the obvious answer. And I think, um, you know, I'm going to say something I don't know. Maybe people think it's controversial. I don't know. I just don't understand why as advocates who care about issues related to fair housing, uh, as housing providers who are not necessarily receiving income uh, and, uh, and other interested parties, why, why we haven't banded together and come closer together, at least so far, to really press our legislators to develop solutions that meet the needs that exist for all of us. Because Rare, you know, typically when I'm when, when we're talking about housing issues, these are groups that are on different sides of a coin. Well, this pandemic has kind of put us all on the same side where the re relief is going to be the answer for all of our problems. And I think that as we develop policy solutions, it's important that government recognize its role um, in providing not just relief, but programs that can help people get out of the jam that they're in. Uh, given the fact that many people are behind on so many housing payments. The other thing that I think is critically important uh, is that we do effectively, and I know Josh is going to like this, we do have to build back better. Uh, and in, in, in doing so in the context of this, I think it means 
developing programs that don't get caught up in a legislative quagmire when uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're looking for looking for solutions. We should have on our books uh, mechanisms that pro that get resources to people automatically without having to go through a legislative situation without having to debate it, especially in situations where people are, you know, fall upon unfortunate times for no fault of their own, such as such as a legislative pan, you know, such as a pandemic. So I think our solutions, when we press our, our leaders in, in government to develop these solutions, there need to be programs that help people retain properties they have, to retain units that they have, um, to make up for, for missed payments. But then we also need to push them to never have to experience anything Sorry. like this ever again. Sorry, that's Siri also talking in the background. Uh, but uh, she's having a hard time understanding me. I think the legislators have too in some respects, but I think you get the point. Uh, this one will be for Josh from Jim Mann. Um, and uh, Jim asks, how can the upcoming Lake Michigan water allocation process be used to address the lead pipe prevalence? And, and I'm gonna add on uh, another part to that question, which is what other mechanisms are there to coordinate water infrastructure investment and, and clean and accessible water? Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks Jim for the question. I think the, to take a step away from the specific rules regarding allocation of Lake Michigan water. It is our belief, uh, it is the legal belief of our partners at the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, and it's the desire of many others, that the state of Illinois, starting with the governor and working down through agencies, more fully utilize the powers that we believe they already have uh, to do a variety of things. One, we think they could already uh, issue a moratorium on water shutoffs and that they are choosing not to. Uh, we believe that those Lake Michigan powers of, of controlling uh, how Lake Michigan water is permitted does give IDNR the ability to dictate the communities must get rid of lead pipes or a variety of other things. That historically is not the kind of uh, hands-on approach uh, that IDNR takes. Uh, we believe that uh, Illinois EPA with a little work could reprioritize uh, its loan funding and grant funding to prioritize uh, communities most in need. So there are powers and authorities and, and money that the state has uh, that it could be using uh, to be more progressive, more equitable, more just, more sustainable on water resources issues, and it just isn't. So across the board, leadership and a vision from the state is needed for these statewide issues. Your second question was about coordination, Justin? I, I think you answered it, yeah. I mean, if you've got more to say, but I think you answered it. I'll just say this, particularly here in Northeastern Illinois, where we have a great density of municipalities. I don't know how I'll say it. Uh, and every single one of them has lead pipes. If there is a state mandate uh, to replace lead pipes, I would truly hope that there will be cost savings found through intergovernmental and intermunicipal cooperation on this. If every community on Western Avenue, south of Chicago, and even into Chicago, has to replace all the lead pipes around that, has to go in, dig up water mains, and so on. You would hope that those communities would get together and do this together uh, to reduce costs for everyone. I think there are great opportunities for coordination at the local level, uh, and a big infrastructure issue like replacing lead pipes may be the prompt to do that. Great. Uh, Audrey, one more for you. Um, so uh, Ellen Partridge asks, sidewalks are clearly important to allow and encourage people to walk. Are there municipalities that clear snow from sidewalks as they do for roads? And more generally, what other options are there for ensuring that our sidewalk system is, is safe and accessible for everyone? Yeah, it's definitely something everyone's been thinking about for the past couple of weeks. Um, there has been, uh, an effort in Chicago to uh, uh, a petition to explore further uh, me mechanisms for clearance of sidewalks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it's something that we have to think about whether we want to institutionalize that as a government responsibility and whether there is the investment desired to have that be part of, uh, you know plowing streets and plowing sidewalks um, as part of government's responsibility. So 
it's it's really a, a choice. I mean, it definitely um, like Lakeshore Drive, the lakefront path, we saw that the city did a really good job with that. And there are, you know, transportation corridors that are critical that are um, side paths. Um, I think the uh, policies for clearing all sidewalks of snow, um, we can certainly look to, I think, other climates like uh, in Canada, where they have snow more throughout the year than we typically do. And, and there uh, are some lessons that we can learn there um, about whether we want to establish um, new types of policies here. Great, I'm gonna ask one more question of the panelists as a whole. Um, so, you, you know, it's going to be a tough budget year. It's going to be a tough year for state government as they try to try to advance all the all the priorities that are already on the governor's plate. Um, so I guess I'd ask to the panel, why is now the time to pursue the policies that you're pursuing? I can answer first. Uh, I think the challenges described here only cost us more money in, in other ways. You know, when we don't house people, we drive up costs in our justice system. Uh, we drive up costs in our uh, homeless system, uh, emergency rooms as well. And so, you know, it, it may be a tight budget year, but part of the reason why we have tighter and tighter budgets increasingly is because where we choose to invest our money is not necessarily the best uh, investment. And so there's no time like the present to start, you know, changing our philosophy and our approach um, to addressing these issues. I think the reason why we want to pursue performance-based planning, um, you know, now is um, if we look at the kind of results we're getting in our transportation system, I mean, you know, that really tells the story. Over the past 10 years, uh, pedestrian deaths have gone up 50% in Illinois. Um, for cl climate change, transportation is the number one contributor. And so I think um, we need to look at the trends that are occurring. And the whole idea is to get the results that we want out of spending billions of public dollars. And if we're not getting the results we want, then we need to um, create a system to focus on those results and prioritize how we spend money based on those getting those outcomes. Yeah, I'll just say specific to the lead issue, more so than the other water issues. No. Every time we wait, more kids get exposed. I mean, the problem doesn't get better. I mean, the time to solve this was 1986 and we've been punting since. That's when they were banned and they should have been replaced then. Um, but I think, I think we're at a moment in, in Chicago and in Illinois in the country where there's a significant distrust of citizens in their government. And I think that is profoundly manifest in water issues. If you cannot trust the water coming out of your sink, if you can't look at a water fountain in a school or a park with your kids and know, mm, safe, not safe. Like if you can't trust a basic function of government, how are you gonna trust government to do any of the stuff that Audrey and Omni were talking about, which is all great stuff too, right? I, I think proving that we can solve this issue, which everyone knows is a problem. There's, there's no lead advocates out there anymore. There used to be, and that's why it was required for a long time. Uh, proving that we can solve this and proving that we can provide a public service that folks can trust, I think would go a long way to helping with a lot of other issues. And the longer it's get kicked down the can, and, and there's more stories like University Park, lead exposure, Galesburg, lead exposure, and of course, Flint, Folks know that we're leaving it in the ground. Folks know that we're leaving it in their water. How, how are you going to trust government? So I, I think there's a big trust issue beyond the water issue and beyond the public health issue that makes this the moment to do something big to restore some trust. Um, with that, um, I'm going to thank our panelists and thank our attendees so much for joining us for today's conversation on MPC State Policy Agenda in 2021. Uh, we've really enjoyed sharing some of our work with you today and hope you've enjoyed it and learned something. 
Uh, a quick reminder, we'll be uploading a recording of today's session to our website and YouTube channel. And we'll also be including a link uh, to the recording in an email to you to keep an eye on your inbox for that. Uh, thanks everyone again for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day.